welcome to all of you and to another series of the Planted Unearthed Talks in partnership with the National Trust here at the beautiful Stourhead House venue. In our latest series of talks entitled Cool Design Sustainable Futures, we'll be exploring how we design spaces, places and systems which mitigate the dual threats to humanity of the climate crisis and biodiversity loss. Last summer, the UK experienced temperatures of over 40 degrees centigrade for the first time. And according to the latest UN report published last month, the world is almost certain to experience new record temperatures over the next five years, with temperatures likely to rise by more than 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. As we enter uncharted territory, the threats posed to human civilization, ecosystems, economies, and global infrastructure are just about to become understood. In a world which is hotting up, what role does design play in keeping, keeping us cool and creating a world where humans can live in harmony with nature and the natural systems with which we rely on? Well, I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to our third talk in the series entitled Save Our Species, where we'll be investigating what we can do to reverse the devastating effects of the human activity on nature and biodiversity. We'll be asking what role can rewilding and regenerative farming play in averting a collapse in biodiversity, which would have a catastrophic effect for humanity and, of course, all nature and systems. And I'd like to welcome an expert panel of guests to explore and discuss this subject. So I'm going to introduce uh, each of our guests in a moment. Uh, then I'm going to ask each of them to actually introduce themselves and uh, tell us a little bit more about their experience and their relevance to the subject. Then we're going to have about half an hour of questions, and then we'll open it up to the floor and you all for questions from the audience. So if you've got any questions, write them down, have them ready. We'll have about a quarter of an hour for questions at the end. So that's probably three to five, depending on how complex they are. So firstly, uh, please grab a round of applause for our, for our panelists. So I'd like to introduce uh, Martin Lyons from Nature Friendly Farmers Network. We've got David Brown, uh, an ecologist from the National Trust, and Paul Cherry from Groundswell Agriculture. So Martin, if I could ask you to introduce yourself, first of all, just three to five minutes. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, so I'm an arable farmer in Cambridgeshire. Grow mainly combinable crops of oats, beans, barley, oilseed, rape. And over the last 20 years, we've been trying to transition our farming business uh, to enhance nature throughout our farm landscape. And the last 10 years, really focusing around soil health. And we've actually, instead of just being an arable farmer, we're re reintroducing livestock to help us move away from artificial fertilizer and, and use livestock as a key tool to build fertility into our soil and manage our flower margins and meadows. But I'm also the UK chair for the Nature Friendly Farming Network, which we set up five years ago. Because like me, there was many farmers across U the UK felt their voice wasn't being heard and represented in farm policy and other organisations. So we're bringing that farming voice together to, to try and make governments and supply change and systems change that really puts nature and climate at the heart of a farming system. Great. Thank you. David. Thank you. Yes, uh, David Brown. I'm... Um an ecologist. I work, I work with the National Trust down in, in um, Dorset on the Purbeck Estate. I guess I've I put my thing of my career in three chapters. I, I, I started life as, a, as an ecologist working on kind of small scale nature reserves where really what we're doing is, is gardening to keep hold of the last little vestiges of good nature we've got on very small, isolated, fragmented sites, um, which is OK. That's kind of kept some of our species here. I then spent a decade working in, in northwest Spain in much, much bigger landscapes where there they don't talk about sort of managing nature. They talk about allowing nature to, to manage itself, really. And that's a question of scale and having big landscapes in which nature is allowed to operate itself. And then for the last decade, I've been back here with the National Trust trying to, yeah, and really, really bringing home that what our approach to looking after species in this country in the past has been we've thought too small. We've thought that you can keep nature in a small nature reserve. And really what happens beyond those nature reserves is somebody else's question. You know, and that's why yeah, we know this country is the vast majority of its productive industrial agriculture. And I think we've all recognized now, both from the farmer side of this and from the ecologist side of this, that, that that's not good enough. And our common agenda now is to, is to look at the whole of our landscape and making it all function for nature. So the work I'm involved in down in Purbeck, I guess there's two sort of areas. One is on a, 
on the, we, we've set up the Purbeck Heath National Nature Reserve. It's the first super national nature reserve in the country, which is linking together seven different landowners across three and a half thousand hectares with an absolutely clear vision about restoring it for, for functional nature. We don't tend to talk about rewilding so much just because that means different things to different people, but it's all about restoring natural processes and a really, you know, nature rich landscape. And that's, you know, that, and we're doing it. That's going really well. But we also have half of our estate down in Purbeck is we have tenant farmers. We have about 12 of our own tenant farmers and we're part of a, in, in South Purbeck, it's a kind of more traditional farming landscape, lots of, of small scale farmers. And we're working, you know, hand in hand with our tenants and other farmers to try and see how you can deliver nature recovery at scale, link up landscapes, but maintain, you know, working businesses, um, farming and more diversified land management. Hmm. Sounds like a delicate balance. It, it's a very delicate balance. Okay, we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, and Paul. Yes, uh, Paul Cherry. I <coughs> farm up in Hertfordshire, um, about a thousand hectare farm, far family farm. Um, <coughs> we're combinable crops and a beef suckler herd, but also there's a lot of other things going on on the farm, so it probably gives us the opportunity to experiment a bit more with our regenerative approach on farming, which we've been uh, we've gone headlong into in the last sort of 11 years, um, and uh, we'll hopefully explore that a bit later. But I also um, I'm one of the host farmers for the Groundswell. We now call it a festival because it's such fun. Um, it's a um, <coughs> it's a sort of home of regenerative farming, if you like. We explore um, farm t really encouraging farmers to think differently and to sort of take their foot off the pedal if they're if they're in, in the sort of industrial model. We're just helping them helping them make their make some different decisions. Great, I, l I love the idea that you're calling it a festival. I mean, I'm w if you're a regenerative farmer, it kind mm. of makes sense that you might be celebrating all life. Uh, including farmers' lives and yeah. their drinking habits in early and early <laughs> hours of the morning, <laughs> by the sounds of it. So I'd like to just kick this off on maybe a slightly more pessimistic note. Um, I'd like you to sort of paint a picture of the biodiversity loss that we've seen in the UK through both the farming communities and also the landscape. Um, Paul, would you like to sort of kick off? How have you seen it? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm passionate about birds, so they're my sort of um, datum, if you like. And I think back to when I was small, and the dawn chorus really was a dawn chorus. So it was just, everything was out there, from cuckoos to warblers. I mean, the difference was I could hear them all in those days as well. But uh, I know they've gone. We know we've got um, this this uh, 70 million bird um, uh, loss in in certainly in my lifetime since the 1960s. That's in uh, the UK, is it? Uh, yeah, sorry, UK, just the UK. I mean. In, Europe wide at 700 million. So, so, um, and I'm sort of super aware of all the mistakes we've made on the farm. Um, in in our, I've been farming for nearly 40 years. Uh, chucking insect insecticides at the farm didn't need to. Chucking wormers at the cattle didn't need to. Supercharging our meadows with fertilizer didn't need to. Just um, because that was sort of the model that I was taught at college, and it's what everyone else did. So. Um, so I feel supremely um, uh, responsible for the fact that that uh, agriculture cannot hide from the fact that agriculture has had a massive impact on the biodiversity loss. So, uh, so all those sort of things that were thrown onto the land, uh, how do they contribute to the, the loss of the the birds? Well, I mean, insecticides are the sort of obvious one. Insecticides are as a as a proportion of your sort of spray bill tend to be very very cheap. So we had situations where our agronomist was, was it, before we, we have a blanket ban on insecticides on the farm, have done for the last 10 years. But it, back in the day, it was kind of, oh, well, just uh, we'll put an insecticide in with that mix. You're going on anyway. Just chuck an insecticide because there's some aphids out there. Uh, they're going to give your, your wheat some virus. And um, it was that, that insecticide, yes, it's killing the aphids, but it's also having a dramatic effect on a whole host of beneficial insects. Spiders, the whole, the whole biodiversity of, of, of the stubble or the, the crop that you're pouring these insects on. So you put tilting nature completely out of balance, not only removing a fantastic feed source, which is the aphids, but also removing the things that eat the aphids. And the, they're good for, they're all eating each other, and it's a, it's a biodiversity. 
so by by um, by chucking those insecticides on. And I remember, I mean, I have one horrible. We used to grow borage, which is, I think they grind up the seed and made hand make um, uh, hand cream or something out of it. It was oh, there's uh, painted lady butterflies in the borage crop. We were spraying painted lady butterflies. I couldn't believe it. I said I'm just not. I don't want to be part of this industry. You know, to make hand cream. You know, how to have things gone that wrong? You know, so um, uh, that's. I, I know that there's a you know that there's a we've contributed mm. badly, but trying to turn the corner, but it's a slow process coming back. Mm. Uh, and David, the, the same question to you: uh, How have you seen biodiversity loss manifest itself as an ecologist? I mean, everything Paul said is absolutely correct. I, I, I'm I was born in 1971, which is about the time my lifespan is is the period in which we've been absolutely massacring nature in this country. Um, and I remember in the sort of late 70s going on family holidays and the car windscreen would be full of dead insects. You know, you'd have to stop and clean your windscreen because of that. That doesn't happen anymore. And I think that's, you know, the, the biggest for me indicator of just quite where we are is the recent stats. And there's various studies coming out with similar data, 70%, 75% loss in insect, not just diversity, but insect biomass in the last 40, 50 years. And that, is, that isn't a warning that, oh, we need to do something because if we need to be careful because otherwise there's going to be an eco ecological collapse coming. That's a sign that we are in an ecological collapse now. So we cannot cope with that levels of loss of biodiversity. That's not just all the diversity of insects losing, it's all the things they support, all the warblers, all the bird life that, that sits above them and everything else. And it's, you know, I think I, you cannot overstate that we're not, this is not a future crisis, this is a crisis we're in now. And I think the... You know, in terms of what's caused that to happen, obviously we know you know the use of chemicals has, has, has been you know, drastic in terms of both the direct impact on on insect life, but also on over fertilizing soils, and really causing you know what we've really oversimplified our our countryside. The traditional extensive farms, small scale farms, were complex. They were messy. You'd have small bits of species rich grass, and next to a hedgerow, next to a pond, next to a little bit of woodland, next to some permanent pasture and it was all that complexity is what nature loves it was messy and we've we've simplified everything we've simplified the soil into a kind of an inert growing medium we've simplified our landscape into huge fields with no structure no 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 habitat in that for instance to live in and that you know that is that industrialization that is is really driven this and that we need to find ways to and, and just to, to reiterate this I'm not a farmer Farmers are as much a victim in this as the cause of it. You know, if you're a farmer now, that's what you have to do to be economic, or that's what we've got to try and find a way to, to turn around and show that you can, you can do something else and still, you know, have a business. Mm. Uh, and Martin, uh, uh, David touched on that idea of an industrialised agricultural system being responsible for this. How do your farmers feel about that? Because obviously they, they have become reliant on that. That's the way they farm for generations, not too many, really, but, you know, within living memory. How do your farmers feel about that? Do they feel that they are responsible, as, as kind of Paul said, for that? Do they realise that their impact of their, you know, relatively small plots are having a, a bigger effect? Can they see that? So uh, the, the membership of the organisation is wide, so from fully organic to people taking the first steps of realising the damage and harm they've done. They've recognised that a lot of it's been driven by government policy and supply chains, encouraging food not to have a speck of damage on it. So you've got to put those insecticides on because the consumer doesn't want that. And many of the farmers have actually realised the landscape's gone quiet. There's no biodiversity left. There's very little worm life left in soils. And they're trying to do what they can and trying to do their, what they can within the framework they're allowed to do because government policy measures it within 10 centimetres. The, the, you know, it's being encouraged to move nature off the farm, farm everything as intensely as possible. But there's some real hope out there and, and farmers are actually trying to build it back and join up and share knowledge of actually what has worked for them. What what can I do and what do I learn from other people and sort of almost leave policy and government and supply chain behind and really leap forward. And, and actually it's finding out it's a more financial viable model and actually understand which... So a lot of farmers are needing help to understand what species they've got or what they should have. We've come normalised to a very quiet countryside and celebrate a skylark. Well, when you should have dozens of skylarks. So when you hear farmers celebrate something, but you've got to normalise that, that's, that's a depleted landscape. So how do we help them count, record, give them the information of what habitat, what process is going back in? 
and we're seeing lots of farmers really get encouraged by uh, seeing hope and seeing things come back and seeing that life cycle of diversity and food production join hand in hand. Uh, are farmers recognising a uh, sort of depletion of yields that parallels a depletion of biodiversity? Or is that, you know, is, are they seeing that actually, you know, they can maintain yields artificially without nature? Or is, there, is that that sort of slowing, glow, slow growing uh, realisation? Mm -hmm. so the two are connected. We have a wide industry that's telling farmers to use more and more products, move more and more inputs to maintain an increased yield to feed a, glo a growing global population. We have to realise 62% of the grain we produce as farmers feeds animals. Well, let's stop feeding them animals. Let's put the animals back on the grass. 20, only 20% 20 of our productive soils is used to grow food that we feed ourselves with, and we throw 44% of that away. So we haven't got to produce more food. We need to eat more of what we produce. And actually, yes, farmers are seeing that the, the financial model of, is more risky with a changing climate, with increased rainfalls and dry summers, if you brought lots of inputs in, you're the one left paying the checks at the end of the season with, a, with an empty shed to sell of grain. And if you can build the model that you minimise or completely reduce your brought-in inputs and maximise what you can, the financial model is so much better. And it's actually more enjoyable and healthy to go out and connect with your soils. So if my grandparents followed a horse and cart, you know, horse and plough, so they smelt and touched nature all the time, then we've gone into a tractor. Then we put it in a cab. And most modern farm businesses now is someone sitting in an office with a type with a laptop and telling the machine what to do. We need to go back and dig a dig a hole, count some worms, go and listen and count. You know, on our farm, I'll put benches up across the farm because I'll go for walking in in the mornings and evenings and sit and listen, and just take it in because that builds your heart. Because farming must feed our stomachs. We must produce food because we want to eat, but it must feed our hearts and our minds as well. And it's that whole system approach that I get real heart, you know, strength of joy from, I've seen farmers see that reality of what can be done. Mm. So, so basically, you know, there's a sort of always on system, you know, yeah, uh, for farmers that you're sitting in an office, you're not connecting with the natural landscape, partly because of technology or pressures of work or probably not social media, I don't know, maybe, uh, but, but you're sitting in your office and, and not connecting. So, so doing a simple thing like just stop and sitting and enjoying the landscape as you probably imagined you always would, uh, it's an important thing for farmers. Yeah, and it's yeah. realising the life cycle of stuff. You want to see a creepy... So on our farm, I want to see aphids, I want to see slugs, because then I've got something that's going to eat that, and it's building that life cycle up. So we, we mustn't just look for pests, we must look for beneficiaries uh, that will eat those pests. And it's you've got to stop. They're little. We haven't noticed them missing in our landscape because they're so small. So sit, take notice. Yeah. Get on your hands and knees, count some worms. Yeah. Uh, Paul, when we spoke, you mentioned a term that I thought was interesting uh, and a sort of starting point for the, for the next part of the conversation, which was you mentioned that we have an extractive farming system. Can you explain what that is, just quite briefly? Yeah, it's sort of taking more than, than, than we should from, from the land. Um, and uh, the, the regenerative model is much more about working with the land, as Martin says, understanding your soils rather better, stopping that sort of chasing yields model, looking looking at the farm as part of our you know, part of the family, <coughs> employing people, employed looking after the family. So not taking too much out of the land, but, but just taking what it's what it's capable to produce. It's basically a more extensive um, system or livestock, uh, no, no longer big yields, but cutting all the time, cutting costs. And the government is helping us with with um, with uh, cut, um, with environmental stewardship grants, <coughs> um, the um, Sustainable Farm Initiative, uh, lots of ways of, of helping farmers actually make that make make the change. And um, certainly from our perspective, and we see a lot of farmers at Groundswell, we're seeing. A lot of the new generation of farmers are slightly saying, I'm not really prepared to be part of this industrial model. I know the fact now about the biodiversity loss or about the, the, the food crisis, the obesity crisis, diabetes, all these things that are wrong with the, the system. They want the, the, the new generation are coming in and sort of saying, yeah, you know, we want to learn how to do it completely differently. Very exciting. So it's an extractive system. It's kind of a linear model. You just you just kind of like take stuff. You kind of sprinkle stuff on to make it grow, and you take it and take Absolutely. it and take it. So it's it's just going to be degenerative 
to the yeah. soil. So are there sort of shocking numbers as to how, you know, how many harvests might we have left if we keep farming in that kind of linear way? Yeah, I keep, <coughs> we know we hear, we hear sort of 60 harvests left. And I'm sure that's the case on some, some land. I mean, a lot of the um, regenerative practices that we adhere to, we've learned, really learned from, from <coughs> uh, they come over from America, where obviously they have the most extreme weather out in the Great Plains watching their soils and two inches of their soil disappear down the Mississippi out into the Gulf of Mexico. You never get that soil back. They can see that happening. Um, they've learned that <coughs> there's no point trying to be clever about um, uh, stopping that soil from either washing away or blowing into the Atlantic, one or the other. You've just got to always have roots in the soil. You've got to be feeding, um, feeding that soil with having living plants in it. But principally, you've got to just hold on to that soil by treating it naturally. This soil is, what we're sitting on, is full of living roots and legumes and look at it, that's going nowhere. That could take 12 inches of rain, nothing would move it. If it was ploughed, you had two inches of rain, it would be on the move. Ploughed soil loses its integrity and um, it, can't, it, it can't hold on to itself. Whereas, um, and, and soil is never meant to be disturbed in nature. There's no such thing as a disturbed, it's a catastrophe if it's disturbed in nature. So um, we're trying to just recreate that model. And David, um, how might, what are the sort of key ingredients of a regenerative um, uh, landscape approach? I think Paul touched on something there which is really worth mentioning again. It's really important, the idea of um, all land can produce, but you've got to look at what it would naturally produce. One of the things we've gone wrong is trying to make marginal soils produce more food than they can sustainably maintain. So I think critical is understanding the sort of natural fertility and the natural productivity of our land. And as a rule of thumb, <laughs> only extract what the land can sustainably maintain. You know, So we, we've gone wrong, I think, in this country in the in sort of middle of the last century when we decided everywhere was agricultural land and everywhere should be grown, you know, managed through the, pro through the prism of, of maximum productivity. And of course, we need to grow food. Uh, and it always frustrates me, the idea of the food security debate being in conflict with nature conservation, because it isn't and it doesn't need to be. Of course, we need to grow food. And this country's got areas of deep, fertile soils where we need to be growing lots of food. Um, but you grow it within the parameters of what that soil can naturally um, maintain. And so a lot of our uplands have become ecological deserts because we've tried to over overproduce those over fertilizers. Sort of one size fits all system. Yeah, and, 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 and our key to that has been chemical fertilizers to make infertile land fertile, and in doing so, it degenerates. So I think the, the first the first kind of principle of regenerative agriculture is understand the soil, understand your environment, understand what is naturally producible. And I think the other thing is, I mean, I've already mentioned soil. Uh, I, you know, myself as an ecologist started off interested in birds and big mammals and things like that. And you realize as you, as you go on, it all comes down to the soil. You, you, you get the soil wrong, everything else collapses, wh whatever you're doing in, in, in land. So I, again, entirely agree with, with, with Paul's sort of saying our priorities there. Um, the principle of regenerative agriculture is, is maintaining a healthy living soil. So soil that's rich in organic matter, soil that's rich in carbon, and a soil that, 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 is, that is full of life. Um, and it doesn't really, I mean, there's all sorts of, <laughs> you can have hay meadows, you can have permanent pasture, you can have, you can have bits of arable as well. You, you know, we need to, all, all these things we need to be doing. <coughs> it's not, there's not one type of farming which is good farming. It's just the, the whole of it needs to be within the parameters of what, what, what the environment can sustain. Um, and it needs to be all mixed up together. And uh, can you sort of explain the difference between, let's say, a regenerative farming model and a rewilded model like they have at NEP? Is that the direction, is that a viable direction for much more of, of the UK's land use? I mean, or is I that just a sort of in, in a single exemplar that can happen here and there? Well, one of the difficulties we have is these terms are mean different things to different people. Both regenerative agriculture doesn't really have a very tight definition and rewilding certainly doesn't as well. So, I mean, I see it as a, as a spectrum, really, um, between um, you know, at the rewilding end of that conversation. You're really, we're doing very, very little. You might still be extracting as they do at NEP. You know, they take beef off that. That's, is that farming? It is in terms of we're, you know, we're, we're, take, we're e feeding ourselves off the land. We're... we're we're, the Perbic Heath, a lot of people call that as a, a, a rewilding project. It's on rewilding Britain's site as a, as a flagship project. We're still supporting farm businesses there. We've got pig farmer, we've got beef, two beef farmers, 
we've got you know other other you know, we've got people grow um honey production various things like that there's yeah it is a productive landscape it's but it's not massively productive because it's very infertile soil so rewilding is still farming in a sense just as it sort of go a bit further down that um that spectrum to sort of the better soils to the area where actually the focus here is still on quite a lot of food production and that's where i would start to think of regenerative agriculture as the, as the term to use where you it, we, we do need to take annual crops off this or annual whether that's a crop of meat or whether that's a crop of cereals whatever it might be but we're doing it in a way that continues to regenerate the soil but they're not they're not it's, it's not uh, a binary thing you know I, I see this as very much as a spectrum all of them what they have in common is we're working within the understanding of how nature works and how soils work and maintaining that critical resource we have of healthy living soil so, so whose responsibility is this i mean obviously uh, the, the farming community are the ones that are kind of hands on managing the land but what role does government and policy and sub subsidies play in in making and allowing this stuff to happen and facilitating the change i'd, I'd say it's all of us it's, it's what we buy what we choose to do so as citizens you know as farmers as citizens we have a we purchase food we have a, a responsibility in, in what we we choose to eat and where it comes from the impact that's had on the landscape as policy makers, they, they really need to move policy, and it is in, in England particularly starting to move, it actually moves, it's not a subsidy, it's a public money that rewards a public good, and managing a landscape, managing soil, biodiversity that actually complements food production and farming. So it's joining that together. And we really need supply chains, and everyone from the supermarkets to the outside retailers and everyone else, to make sure their food products has a positive impact on a landscape, not a negative because we offshore things, we turn it out of sight. It's how do we make sure that we all take our steps. It, I often refer it to like a three-legged stool. It, you know, we have government policy as one, we have citizens and, and the supply chain, and the farmer sits on the bit on the, on the top. And if we get the three right, we actually really can recover our landscapes, biodiversity, mitigate climate da harms and damages, but they've all got to come together. So we must all take our responsibilities but we must also, as citizens, champion to policymakers, MPs, to make sure they do the right thing. When you go purchasing food, ask the question, where does it come from? What's the impact? Is this real truthful uh, labelling system that represents the food I want to eat? Well, and what do you think of that, Paul? Uh, I t totally agree with what Martin said. I think the, it, but it's terribly difficult. Um, the public, the buying public, food buying public, are slightly overwhelmed with different labels. There's red tractors and there's pre range and all the stuff we know about <coughs> organic, all these labels that are stuck on. And it's pretty confusing if you're a housewife pushing a trolley around a supermarket. Or house husband. Uh, sorry? Or house husband. Oh, sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> to to or house child. Um, uh, you're quite right. Um, so, um, very confusing for them. And, and um, uh, we are working on trying to sort of to, to make a label of regenerative because we think it's a fantastic label and should be right up there with organic in terms of the sort of, we're not looking for moral high ground, but for sort of a regenerative model. Regenerative is about handing your farm in better condition than you found it. Think. So, so, but it's really difficult. It means people coming around with clipboard saying, well, you've got a direct drill, you've done this, you've done that, you haven't done that. Um, <coughs> farmers are going to really run, run, run uh, shy of that. But um, but I totally agree with Martin to sort of <coughs> guys like you. I'm sure you all buy very carefully. You're buying from farm shops. You're buying, but it doesn't stop you always asking the question: Is this beef pasture fed? You know, the chickens. What does free range mean? You can ask that question, you know, you, and and um, it's a fundamentally important question. I, I'm sort of quite concerned about the greenwash around food production in the UK. Yeah. Like you said, there's loads of different labelling systems. You go to the supermarket. Uh, and you've got the name of a farm, it looks suspiciously like a sort of made up name. <laughs> and then you go like, well, do I really trust this meat, this, that, whatever? There's three different grades of it. Uh, I, I mean, personally, I've had, a, you know, such a mistrust of the meat industry that I got, you know, what? I, I'm going to go just kind of plant based because it's sort of at least I know that it's going to, you know, it's just going to cut one aspect out that I really don't trust. Um, is that. Is that, you know, a realistic thing? Should we be eating meat? Should we be going plant-based? Uh, how does a consumer navigate their way through doing the right thing? Is it is it just going to farm shops and supporting uh, 
a retail system where you can ask somebody for a direct question. Because if you walk around a supermarket, the, the people stacking the shelves are not responsible, they're on a minimum wage. So it's very difficult to get to the bottom of that. How does a consumer navigate that and the greenwash and all the labeling systems and all the stuff that goes on? With great difficulty um, and um, <coughs> possibly having to be prepared to pay a bit more for their food. Um, I'm sure you all do anyway, but uh, <coughs> um, food as a proportion of the average weekly spend for the average family is right down at the bottom of sort of, it's in the low teens of your, of, as a proportion of the, of the weekly spend. That is a shockingly low amount. Probably go back to 1945, it would have been closer to 50% of your, your weekly spend. <coughs> There's been this drive to the bottom, this race to the bottom for, for food pricing, and we're constantly getting bleating in our ears about, about um, uh, food price inflation and cost of living crisis. And so, so it's almost sort of justifies in people's minds, oh my goodness, food is, food is really expensive. It's not expensive, it's incredibly cheap. Stop spending money on everything else, actually. Spend a bit more on food. And it's very easy for me to sit here and say that. But jolly hard if you're a house husband pushing um, a trolley with three kids in the back. And, and um, we, we also have a multiple other pressures, don't we? I mean, you know, yeah. we, 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 you yeah. kind of have to have a broadband, particularly if you've got, you've got exactly. kids or if you work from home. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then we have subscriptions to things. And, then you know, so yeah. there are all these other costs that we wouldn't have had 20 years ago, even yeah. really, or, or 30 years ago. Um, so obviously, the, you know, the government can consider there's retail, there's the consumer. Um, David, tell me how technology might be helping us to um, support biodiversity and actually um, investigate and, and collect data, analyze and, and to do better. Um, in terms of how we analyze and understand nature, we're at a point of real uh, technological change at the moment. So as an ecologist, um, I, I, I used to go out counting butterflies and things like that. Um, there's, we're starting to understand really the use of things like eDNA testing to properly understand our soils, how, how diverse they are. And there's various things along, you know, pretty much whichever biological metric you look like now, we're, we're starting to get much smarter at being able to understand the condition of our yeah, my, my work now ranges from using drones and satellite imagery to understand how complex our landscape is. Uh, you know, is there connectivity for habitats through to doing soil samples, which we send off to a lab which does eDNA, which tells us just r actually how, how complex and how diverse is that soil. So at that level, um, yes, there's technology. I think in terms of, I mean, these, these two guys are much better placed than I am to talk about how technology is helping us l manage the land um, uh, efficiently, but just what one piece of technology we're using in which uh, which I love actually it's it's in it's about how we get uh, extensive grazing uh, efficient within big landscape where you might lose your cattle is we've started to use um, no fence collars on cattle so rather than having to have a physical fence boundary um, our cattle wear um, a collar and in fact if I have my phone with me I could tell you exactly where they are because it's sending us a GPS signal every 15 minutes telling us where they are so in terms of being able to efficiently work with you know animals on a big landscape you can do that it tells in it tells us things about their body temperature how much they're moving compared to the rest of the herd so you as a stocksman know if your animal is 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 kind of healthy or not if it's about to go into labor or not all that all that sort of stuff which is you, know, you suddenly realize you can work with wild systems but still be responsible for everything from animal welfare to, to, to a being efficient use of your time, you know, that sort of stuff. So there is, uh, and the other thing about the nose fencing, you, rather than having a fence, you have it, it has a sort of a virtual, uh, a virtual electric fence. So if it goes near to the boundary of the polygon, you set it, it hears an audible signal. If it ignores that audible signal and goes a bit mm. further, it gets an electric pulse. So we're grazing areas of the landscape now, which really ecologically benefit from having grazing animals without putting, without putting fences in, just because a smart app which just does it so there's technology all around us and that's that's part of um you know efficient efficiency in land management and it's still you know it, we need to be efficient use of our, of our time to work within nature i'm sure these two can tell me yeah. much more about actual technologies on a day-to-day -day farm management basis. I, I like that system i might note that one down for my teenage <laughs> yeah, children no, really <laughs> yeah. just a, it's only a mild electric shock <laughs> <laughs> but, you know. but what's interesting so we, we've been using this for three years now 
uh, this year our cattle have had no shocks. They learned or really? they've learned weeks training to respond to the audible signal. So they they get near the edge of the boundary. We said oh, that boundary moves. We move them around the landscape. Hmm. Um, they get near it. Hear a hear a hear a little beep, well a loud beep actually, and then they just turn around and walk back. And um, and it's a way of you know mimicking what nature would do. Herds move around the landscape uh, without having to. You know, spend all the you know. It's it's a very low cost input system. That's yeah. what we're talking about. We're we're accepting we'll have lower yields. We need to have lower inputs, lower financial inputs. That might be lower chemicals, but it's also we've got to make use of the of, of the of the time of our you know farmers have got can't, can't be wasting time. Can they? Yeah, yeah. Paul, you you were telling me telling me when we spoke about some incredible systems that are really identifying the source of pests that meant that you we didn't have to spray entire. Oh yes, yeah. So fields and crops, so we didn't have to like blanket cover everything. Yeah. But you could really <coughs> identify. Could you tell me a little bit more it's about? I mean, it sounds like amazing technology. Yeah, it's really it's pinpointing. It's quite new technology, but it's but it's it's happening and it's being trialled all over the world now. But so robot tractors, um, uh, sp sp crop spraying is an incredibly inefficient system. You've got a a, um, a tank full of chemical and a, the booms are spraying, and they the sprayer currently drives across the field and sprays a diluted chemical across the whole field, whether or not it's spraying on on uh, weeds or not. The modern, uh, the, these robot tractors are much smaller, but, but uh, lighter, they're um, solar panelled, they, they don't have a, there's no man driving them, um, and they make their way across the field on the GPS system and can actually identify weeds and and either squirt a bit of chemical at them or, or heat or electric and um, kill, kill individual weeds. It is, um, that's, where it sh that's where it needs to be. And, and it's very, very, very early days, but I'm sure it'll, sure it'll come. Uh, they're also much lighter, so not squashing the soil down. You can have a whole swarm of these things driving around on your farm rather than having one 20 ton machine with 36 meters marching with a guy propping up his eyelids driving this driving the tractor around your farm but very very chemical uh, very very heavy chemical use on, on the old system very very light on the new yeah, system yeah. so it sounds like there are you know multiple changes happening across government technology society uh, so quite a changing system for farmers how are the next generation of farmers Finding this, um, I mean, is there resistance from an older age group uh, and uh, and a sort of interest from a younger age group about wanting to reconnect with a more regenerative approach? I mean, um, Martin, what are you seeing? I, I, I think it's really mixed. Uh, lots of young people are really interested in doing things differently. They've sort of remembering what the grandparents did, or, and that some of the, some young people are still in a community of intensive farming. So you you react to what your peers are saying. So our agriculture universities are still teaching a really intensive system. They haven't transitioned yet. And those students that will be leaving in a few years' time will go back to businesses that are still may not have done the first steps of change. So it's really challenging. But it's bringing people together, peer-to-peer, farmer-to-farmer learning, sharing best knowledge. And actually, some of the young people are really excited within... Oh, they're really concerned around the challenge because farming is changing like it's never changed before in a very short period of time. The way uh, payment supports, market weather, input prices, market prices. But they're actually looking at a more diverse landscape, more stacking enterprises, other income streams, and really getting focused around running really efficient businesses that actually help recover nature, be really regenerative, adding different aspects to businesses. So you might have some honeybees, you might bring some livestock on to graze the man la landscape instead of an arable, and doing different things. And that's where I think the energy really comes from within those. But there are also some older generations that are suddenly saying, actually, I did this 60 years ago. Yeah. Um, we've just got to go back a bit and, and just wind the, the inputs off and back to that kind of system and balance their farming landscape that actually enhances... Uh, and gets the right output that, um, off the land because the way we farm, we should be taking off the surplus, not excess, and it's back to that kind of model. Um, and I think that's the blend of, it's not about just the A generation, it's got to be spread right across the generations. Mm. Okay. 
so I've got a couple more questions before we have questions from the audience. So, so note them down. Uh, mm. Just sort of starting to wrap up. What what do you think the future of land management might look like? Are we going to convince sort of wider groups to participate in regenerative approaches? Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, despite all the doom and gloom, I think this is a time of real optimism and hope. There's, there is, as Martin said, there's, there's change going on like never before in farming. And there is a generational change, I think. We, were, we know, I know many farmers who've all their working career, the last 40, 50 years has been production, production, production. But the generation coming behind them recognises that that is not a viable future. The whole, you know, the leaving the common agricultural policy, the fundamental change in what we subsidise farmers to do means in most marginal areas, the existing farming businesses, they won't survive. They, they, and, 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 and farmers are not stupid, they know that. And there's a real, well, some of them bring it on, some of them reluctant, but everybody recognises there's a need to change just to survive. And that is a real opportunity. And, and we're, you know, in I'm not sure how, how much people will be aware of what's going on in terms of the new subsidy systems that replace the old common agricultural policy. But the principle of only subsidising with public money for public goods is, if it's properly funded, a fantastic opportunity to actually incentivize farmers to manage land in a way that's regenerative and is gonna make nature thrive again. And and I know many young farmers who are really quite excited about that. There's a lot of risk. Time, you know, that for if you, if you're if this is your you know, farmers don't make a lot of money. If, it, if you're on the breadline anyway, any kind of change is a risk, and risk is scary. And we, I think, as a wider, certainly as a, from the National Trust as a landlord, we need to support our farmers through that transition. But actually, everybody does as well. And I think it comes back to one of the questions you asked earlier about what the consumers do. The most fundamental thing consumers do is take an interest, is understand, is think about where your food comes from and take an interest in the countryside. You know, we're, we're, we've never been, as a society, never been more divorced from nature. You know, most, most people just ha virtually never have any direct contact with, with, with nature now growing up. And that is, you know, we need to unpick it to that level so that people connect and care and actually recognise that, that it does matter what happens in the countryside, how farmers manage their land. And if, as a society, we need to embrace that and, and support that and... It, and you know, and if we can do that, then I think there is optimism uh, for change. And I know there's plenty of the future farming generation who will be you know, very capable of embracing regenerative agriculture and doing it well. But it has to be a whole society thing. It seems as if the pandemic gave us a little bit of an insight on, on the fragility of the sort of a supply chain system of the food that we would expect to be on our sh shelves. Uh, uh, quite recently, you know, thinking about the kind of lack of tomatoes when they were kind of piling up in France and there were none here. Like, what's going on? You know, there is, the, it sort of just pulls back the curtain a little, little, bit, little bit about kind of what's going on and what we're just kind of blindly walking into. Um, uh, uh, Paul, you know, is there anything you can just sort of say to the audience if you go away and you read, you look at one thing, uh, what, what would you recommend they do? Uh, <coughs> well, we've got a... Um General election coming up. Think very carefully about who you vote for. That's always that's a that's a nice one. <coughs> when you're shopping, think very carefully about how you shop and 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 um, and, and ask those questions. Um, and um, there was a third one. I've now totally with, with, the, with the political system without naming the group. Are, are there some uh, political parties that are supporting farmers better? They got better policies. And others, or, or are they all sort of sort of saying they're going to do great things? And that, <coughs> yeah, I mean, we all get a bit cynical, don't yeah. we? But um, uh, since getting <coughs> since getting out of Europe, um, we've had this op we have had this opportunity to break away from the European subsidy, which was sort of just land based. <coughs> As Martin said, the, the the government has been very supportive of of um, listening to what the public wants, and the public um, is very interested in in the landscape in any shape or form. You can barely turn on the telly without seeing Country File or Farming Life or Jeremy Clarkson or <coughs> Spring Watch. Um, so we're getting, you know, the, the, the public is becoming, I think, more aware of, 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 <coughs> of the landscape, if you like, or the environment. Um, so I think they are, I think, sorry, government, our current government has been, has been very supportive of um, stewardship schemes in various in various shapes and sizes um 
Republican have a change of government? I don't know. I, you know, I'm not again get into politics, but but um, uh, I, I'm, I'm impressed that the, the shift has been towards something that that is is looking after the environment a little bit better, a lot better than we were even ten years ago. Hmm. Um, oh, sorry, uh, do you have any suggestions, anything that uh, our audience can go and investigate a little bit more? Um, take an interest, find out about it, understand where your food comes from, and go out into the countryside and connect with nature and understand, you know, just, just enjoy it. But I think Marty said early on, it's, you know, it, if this is just a theoretical thing, we'll never, we'll never get anywhere. You only get so far with your head. This needs to be something that people really, really care passionately about it, and it needs to... Every decision we make, from who we vote for, you know, possibly the most important of all, um, down to everything we buy, understand the impact of that in the environment. We are, as I say, we're not, as I said at the beginning, we're not facing an environmental crisis. We're absolutely in the middle of one now. And, and we all need to, to recognise that and, and, and wake up to it. Martin, any, any suggestions for our audience? First, I want to go back just a tiny bit. We need a wilder landscape, not just rewilding over there and intensive there every bit of landscape including our gardens and everything else needs to have nature in it obviously we, so then the next thing would be is go and find out the farmers that are doing those things go and talk to farmers go and find them on social media engage and actually almost congratulate engage with them positively that you welcome that change and that delivery and then understand where your food comes from because then we all have choices and then it's those are through your supply chain your politicians whatever ask the question if you go eat somewhere, where's the food come from? What kind of impact have you? So it's, it's about taking ownership, because we all have ownership of the problems we have. And we, some of us can take little steps. We can do a little thing, and we can take one cha change. But if everyone did one change, that would make a massive difference. And those that can, do a bigger step and get moving, and we will see a momentum happen, because we cannot sustain what we're losing at the moment. And actually, that is the real risk around food production, nature, and everything else. We are running out of time, and we really need to act fast. Right. Do we have any questions from the audience? Thank you. Uh, we've got a microphone here. If anyone's feeling brave, you're amongst friends. <laughs> Can I just say, it's Open Farm Sunday this, um, this Sunday. So farms all over the country are opening their doors. Great opportunity. Take the kids. Cost nothing. Go and see a, a real farmer. And ask those questions, do what Martin's talking about. They're, they're, they are opening their doors for that exact reason. So, so support it. Uh, any questions? Uh, in the blue hat. Thank you very much for what you've been saying. Should we slow down the use of the expression gross domestic product, GDP, and increase the use of the expression global resource management. Wow. Who am I going to pick for this one? <laughs> I thought that was, uh, yes. This is the second difficult question from you. A good question. <laughs> Martin, how do you feel about that? <laughs> yes, we need to take account of cost yeah. globally. We're going to have to trade. We're going to have impacts of weather and have excess we can share and then also bring in so we need to have that more balanced approach around how do we trade in a way that has a positive impact and, and sort of minimise what we take from landscapes and express it in a different economic model. Uh, to recognise, I mean, it sort of comes down to that idea of donut economics. You know, it's so GDP doesn't recognise the impact that we have on the environment. It just looks at gross domestic product. So uh, the idea of donut economics sort of puts that back into the system. And uh, that's a good one to investigate there are people who've written about it very well. And just, I haven't really, yeah. just quickly touch, most of our food does not take in a, into account, and more, everything else we buy, the impact for climate or nature. So wouldn't it be great to have a taxation system that that, that harms most, you pay most for? Because we'd all shift. Yeah. Um, and it just balances that the ec economics of it back to a sensible place. We'll be paying the true price That's of the right. food as opposed to just what we've managed to create it for using uh, industrial agricultural systems, yeah. artificial systems. Oh, to just add on to that, I think yeah. uh, my short one-word answer would also be yes, we do. And I think there's two strands to that. One is getting away from gauging success based on growth, because we know that is clearly fundamentally unsustainable. So resource management rather than product is, is the term we should be thinking about. 
But the other strand of that is global rather than domestic. We can't outsource our our problems to somewhere else. You know, this has to be a globally sustainable system. It's one planet, so it's it's very easy to come up with sustainable systems. But actually, just you know, by buying stuff from elsewhere, uh, we have to think of this globally. And that's uh, that's <laughs> great idea. Very difficult to start. You know, the whole planet thinking in that mentality. But but yes, we do. Uh, another question. A uh, gentleman at the back in the white hat. Is that a gentleman? Yeah. Do the panel feel it would be feasible to label our foodstuff supply chain by embodied carbon between planting and the shop floor? Hmm. Very difficult, I'm afraid. Very difficult. Currently, I think almost impossible. But but um, because there are so many, I don't know if you guys agree, but I, I just think there's there's so many different parameters, but it's a wonderful thing to aim for. And I shouldn't I shouldn't be so too dismissive of it. But I think um, it uh, sounds like a terrifyingly uh, and, and probably quite an easy thing to fudge as well. I suspect um, we have this situation at the moment where where everyone's very interested in carbon in soils. There is no datum, there's no um, standard model for reading carbon in that soil compared to that bit of soil there. It's, it's absolutely extraordinary. You'd have thought it'd be fun, really, it's such a fundamentally important question that you thought somebody had, would have devised a sort of gold standard way of reading it. There is no gold standard at the, mo at the moment. And that goes for America as well as us. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of chat out there, not a, not a lot of, of true realities. So um, I'd be nervous about making aims that, that are very hard to achieve. If the sole focus is minimizing carbon, how do we measure the impact of biodiversity loss? I mean, it, it doesn't seem like a broad enough spectrum or investigation to capture the, 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 wild, the wider picture of a regenerative farming system. So that's my, my concern, and I, I feel it in the building industry as well, that we're so focused on carbon, the embedded carbon, yeah. or the in-use carbon, that we're not reflecting on the quality of the environment, the qualitative aspects, the, our relationship to it. You know, we can have a low-carbon building, but essentially if it's a well-insulated box that has no windows, it's just super efficient, who's going to want to go and work there? So if, if all we do is measure through carbon, then we, we kind of miss out a whole raft of other essential aspects, I think. Yep. Uh, certainly in the building industry, and I would imagine it's sort yep, of similar. Totally, totally. There, there, is, there is legislation coming that all the major brands are going to have to report their carbon footprint of their supply chain. So their scope three, that, that's embedded in moving products about. and So that's going to make things change. And they're all, many of the lady, leading brands are already asking, how do we measure what we're going to do? And they're also, in a few more years, it's going to be about biodiversity. So it's coming, but we haven't got any baseline, we haven't got any matrix, and it's not a global system. We're going to see different systems measuring in different ways. The, the danger with creating a baseline for biodiversity is it'll be the baseline measured at that point, not the from bit. where we've come from, yeah. which we know has been a massive problem. Uh, any other questions? Uh, uh, the lady in the, yes, in the red skirt. Thank you. Fascinating talk. Um, Farmers make up a very small proportion of the population, and yet you are the conservators of, the, of, of all this land. Um, there seems to be still an enormous disconnect between farmers and the rest of the population, and we're all consumers, but surely most people have parks or little gardens or even window boxes, they should be almost invited to be farmers as well. But how can we, how can we encourage them? Share that sense of custodianship. Yes. Uh, for whatever land do you own? Yeah. How do, you, how do we engage people in that? Yeah, does social media have a role to play? You know, you know, are there farmers on TikTok? Go on, so it's huge amounts of farmers going on TikTok, yeah. YouTube videos, Twitter, Instagram. It's fascinating them, them communicating their story. We must take reality and we must take ownership of what we've created as farmers, as an industry. We've told public to get off the land. 
get your food from the shop and disconnect ourselves. And actually, we've got to welcome you back in. We're going to have honest and, and uh, constructive engagement around where does access happen, the responsibility of closing gates and dropping litter and dogs off leads. But we've got to reconnect people, nature, landscapes and food and farmers. We can't keep that separated any longer. OK, great. Good answer. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, gentleman in the front. Uh, you, you're on the panel, all farm or managed land on quite a large scale, uh, which presumably has sort of economies of scale attached to it. How do you think regenerative agriculture can work on much smaller, say, 250 acre family farms? I think, I think if you're prepared to um, uh, engage with the public, uh, add value, stack enterprises, uh, there are plenty of people doing exactly that on pretty marginal land. But um, I know that we've had a speaker at Grantsville, who, a butcher, who, who's turned, if you th imagine a, a, the, the wholesale value of a, of a, if you sell a fat steer to an abattoir, think of it as being sort of 1,500 pounds as a sort of wholesale price. He can turn that 1,500 pounds into seven or eight grand. If you, that's not West London prices. That is making use of everything down to making stock from the bones. That's the thing. You know, if you're prepared to really, really knuckle down and and um, uh, and do that sort of thing, and then have chickens following the cattle, you know, there there are there are ways and means. But it's but it's a but it's a different mindset to the sort of agriculture that we're probably used to, which is broad acre, uh, you know. Um, lowering fixed cost per, per acre, all that sort of stuff. But it, yeah. I think we're coming, so a lot of our tenants are that sort of scale, although National Trust is a big landowner, we're working with businesses who are small, small scale farmers. And um, I think the idea that you can extensify um, and still make a, a, you know, a living off a small amount of land just from food production is probably a myth. You can't, you know, you need to have, if it's, if you're talking about lower input, lower output systems, yes, they're, they're, they're more efficient, but you probably do need to diversify as well. And we, I think there's a transition probably for a lot of our farmers, particularly in the, in the more marginal soils, to stop thinking of themselves purely as food producers and think of themselves as land managers. And they're producing various products which benefit lots of people. So food is one of those products. Um, clean water, carbon-rich soils, another product. Public access is another product. Nature is another product. Uh, and all of those things are actually monetizable one way or another, whether it's through kind of new, the whole, we haven't even touched on the whole new world of, of green finance and, gr and, and sort of investment in, in, in people who will sequester carbon for you or clean water for you. Um, and, you know, through, we, and farmers, even small scale farmers are stacking their finance models. Like you've got food production, you've got subsidies, you've got carbon, you've got clean water, you've got public access and what you might license, how you might monetize that, you know, all these things are what's making a, a viable business model. And actually, it is, it is viable, even on marginal soils, it's viable on small farms, but not if you think my only product is food. Uh, and equally, I guess, uh, to a certain extent, um, commercialization and education. You know, net farms do safari trips yeah, absolutely, now. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. And, uh, you know, you were talking, when we were talking earlier, uh, about... The, the numbers of tourists coming to I, I, I'll give that example your corner of the so we on, on one of the on the on the Perbeck Heaths again um, very marginal farm uh, farmland there was a you may have seen about it on spring watch recently the ospreys um, that are the breeding in Pool Harbour for the first time in 200 years that was an introduction on not on on RSPB land the National Trust land but on a private estate there um, and because they're interested in nature recovery now they didn't do it as an economic thing. But that first year they were there, they put on three boat tours for the public, thinking maybe people would be coming and interested in seeing ospreys in the landscape. They all filled up instantly. The next year they put on 30 boats. This is with hundreds of people on paying 30 quid a time. This year there's 60 boats. People are desperate for nature experiences in this country. And, and ecotourism is easy to think, oh, that's a solution for all. You need to manage it well and not everything works, but actually managed well. And this is where farmers working together at a landscape scale, and there's lots of that going on now, the idea of farm clusters, landscape recovery partnerships. Actually, a vision for nature 
you know, that is an economic gold mine potentially if you do it well and you can, you know, learn to monetize that. So, yeah. And, 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 yeah. So this time next year, dung beetle safaris at Planted <laughs> Country. I see Sam's ears picking up there. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Okay, well, uh, we've run out of time. Uh, thank you so much. I, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. Uh, it's just been really interesting to learn about this idea of going from an extractive to a regenerative system, the impact that land management has, so the change in social values, the technological and economical economic changes that are all happening, and how we can essentially go from uh, a system that is just depleting the quality of our land, our soils, and our food to one that has a viable future. So uh, thank you, firstly, to our three panelists. Could we have a, a round of applause for Martin, <laughs> David, and Paul? I'd also, thank you very much. Uh, I'd also very much like to thank the National Trust and Stourhead House for hosting us. Uh, if you enjoyed this talk, please do go to our website, which is uh, planted-community.co.uk. There's loads of talks that we've previously done on there. There's interviews, there's information about our partners uh, and, and uh, lots of environmental conversations. So please do take a look at that. In the meantime, uh, please do go and enjoy the rest of Planted Country. There are lots of suppliers, there's events, uh, uh, there's wellbeing events, uh, all the people that are here have an enormous amount of knowledge and expertise, great conversations and history around sustainable products. Please do go and have a chat with them. And, and thank you all for coming and sitting in the sun. I know it's, it's very hot. <laughs> um, my name's Oliver Heath, and this has been Save Our Species. Thank you very much. <laughs>